Yeah, and I'm not quite sure whether Vancouver is in California time zone or not, uh, where they start a little later, but you know, let's get started. Uh, and uh, so this is the tutorial on the role of large language models in planning. Um, and it was supposed to be given by three people. Um, Karthik Valmikam, Lin Guwan were going to actually give the talk. And I would sit like you guys in the back of the room and sleep. And, um, and the, the Canadian visa people had other ideas, so they did not give either of them visas. So you are stuck with listening to me for four hours, minus half an hour for actually getting coffee. Um, so, and so that's, of course, Subha Rao, Kamabhati Rao is uh, the guy who's giving the talk. That's me. Um, and the slides are at that particular uh, URL. You should be able to get it. I will show the slides thing multiple times during the talk in case you have trouble you know, catching it if you come late. I mean, those people who come late. Um, anyway, so that's the basic deal. Um, and then, so let me get started. Um, so what's the aim of the tutorial? First of all, what do you want to know? It's large language models. So that should be enough, right? But uh, the part, of course, is that there's been a significant increase, of course, in LRMs. That's pretty much obvious. Um, and then in addition to what they're good at, there's also lots and lots of hope that they should be good at pretty much everything. They may well be AGI uh, minus T5 or something, and they should be able to do everything. And so the question is, uh, can they do reasoning and planning? Uh, as we'll see in a minute, actually, um, you could think of large language models based on the way they've been trained as a system one, for those of you who know system one, system two uh, metaphors that I will talk about a little bit. Um, so it would be indeed very nice if in fact, they also happen to just do reasoning and planning and you know, and slicing the bread and you know, dicing it, et cetera, on the side. Um, and there are actually been multiple papers written in pretty well-known conferences. I won't name names, could be NeurIPS, could be iClear, could be Triple about how, in fact, they're all doing all this sort of nifty planning and reasoning. Um, and then turns out that the question, of course, is if this is true, that's pretty impressive because a system one is doing system two without actually doing, um, without actually having, you know, having to do anything spe you know, special. Um, so unfortunately, as we'll see, um, it's actually not true uh, that it's not going to be, LLMs are not able to do planning. Uh, please don't leave yet. Um, you know, um, but, but you can actually use them to do planning, you know, so they can be a very useful part of a larger architecture that I'll call LLM March Law architecture. Um, that would be very helpful. Um, it's important to know what they can do and what they are helping doing, um, because otherwise, you know, that's the whole point of research. That's the whole point of understanding the technology. Okay. So the a tutorial, to some extent, this one is uh, an attempt to rectify some of the misconceptions as well as show constructive uses of LLMs in planning um, and reasoning tasks. I will focus on planning, but reasoning tasks are connected in some various places. For example, we'll talk about plan verification, which is sort of reasoning, and it turns out they're bad in that too, okay? Um, so here's the broad lessons of the tutorial, okay? The red part is all downer, right? LLMs can't do something. And the green part is all nice. The LLMs can actually be helpful to you. So we'll talk about how both LLMs can't do the kind of tasks normally considered planning. For example, I'll show you that LLMs can't do planning in autonomous mode. That means if you ask them to solve a planning problem, it will give something. It just won't work. Okay. And if you are in the loop, you'll say, ah, it's pretty good, nice effort, etc. But if you actually try to evaluate it in any systematic way, it turns out that they're actually pretty bad, as we'll see. Um, and then, of course, uh, chain of thought, fine tuning, et cetera, don't help that much. This is all negative, right? I mean, in fact, you came here to think that chain of thought should be helpful. It turns out it's not very useful. I'll tell you why. Um, and it's actually some of the reasons it's not useful in planning. It's also going to connect to reasoning tasks. Uh, fine tuning doesn't really help that much. It's just a way of compiling sometimes. And, you know, it's, it's a worthwhile, you have to decide whether it's worthwhile your task, worth your time. 
And, and then of course the other idea is maybe they can't give the plan right away. They can think a little bit, verify, reflect, and try to improve their plan, self-verification, self-consistency, tree of thoughts, all that stuff. It turns out, no, it actually, they cannot self-verify. And if you do a systematic evaluation, and if they are trying to verify their guesses, their performance goes down, which shouldn't be surprising to you. If you don't know the answer in an exam and you guess something, just go with the guess. If you try to second guess yourself, you're more likely to actually worsen your performance. We'll actually show um, systematic studies of that. Um, and then of course, the last thing is maybe humans iteratively prompting the LLM until they get the solution is a good idea. But that's, as we'll find out, is a dumb idea in multiple cases unless the humans know what the right answer is. If you are using an LLM to improve your essay and you know whether or not an essay is already good, we by all means do it. If on the other hand, you're trying to use LLMs to figure out what is the capital of Belize and you don't know what the capital of Belize is, asking it in 18 different ways isn't going to increase any of your trust. You might as well ask Google at that point of time. So we will actually look at that point that you know having humans, sometimes what happens is when people claim that LLMs are solving with iterative prompting, this is a classic case of what's called the clever hands phenomenon. I mean, how many of you have heard of clever hands, the amazing horse from Germany, which used to do arithmetic, okay? So like if you say seven plus five, it would stomp its hoofs, you know, exactly 12 times. And then so the guy who owned this horse took it around, you know, all over Europe, you know, in the beginnings of the century, and he was making good bucks, okay? And it turned out that a bunch of psychologists who were all spoiled sports said, hey, how is this possible? Come on, I mean, how are horses learning arithmetic? We, you know, where exactly is this going on? And then they actually found out that what the horse is sensing is the stress level of the owner when it comes close to the correct answer. So if you have already stomped 11 times, and if you stomp at the 12th time, the owner is very worried that you might actually stomp 13th time and that would all screw up the whole thing. And so what it was doing is sensing the stress level. We do know that animals tend to sense the stress level, but that's different from doing arithmetic. So they actually, how did they found, prove this? You can look it up in Wikipedia. They essentially made sure that the owner is nowhere in the vicinity and this stuff was coming out on some sort of a megaphone and the horse was just as bad as normal horses. No clever hands anymore, okay? So this sort of thing happens when humans are actually doing iterative prompting because we tend to essentially give away parts of the answer. If you happen to know the answer, if you don't know the answer, all bets are off. Okay, so that's the red part. And I will actually walk you through this because it is possible that you mostly heard only the positive news and not what they can't do. And it's important to understand what they can't do. Um, and the green part is the availability of LRMs actually increases. It can increase the range of planning tasks that can be supported. So if you think in terms of classical knowledge representation, planning, et cetera, they have obviously their own expressiveness limitations. So the general idea of a KR system and a planning system is it's your responsibility to make sure that the problem you have is actually representable in the language I have. And if it is, then I'll take my time and try to see if the answer is there. If it's not, then you know, take a hike. Okay, and it turns out that there are planning problems that might actually be much, you know, may not actually fit into your specific Procrustean bed. And in those kinds of cases, LLMs are actually very good at guessing plans for any level of complexity of the planning problem. It's not that they're harder in trying, they have a harder time trying to guess the answer for a semi-decidable problem, whereas they have easier time trying to guess the answer for a polynomial time planning problem. That's not true. And, and in fact, in general, they're able to guess, and the guess part depends on, of course, the humongous amount of uh, knowledge that they've been trained on, which is our collective conscious that we've been put it on our web, on the web. And so it actually can be quite useful. And, and I show you how the LLM's way of using this sort of guessing can be combined with verifiers and critiques that come from sort of standard AI techniques um, such that you can significantly improve the expressiveness of the kinds of planning problems you can solve with soundness guarantees. And if you're wondering, how do you get soundness guarantees? Think of the following thing a generate, test, framework, 
will give sound answers if the tester is sound. Okay, that's a theorem, right? And so the question then is, as, as long as you have critiques that actually are sound, the guesser basically, and the guesser is good at giving, coming up with reasonable guesses, you're more likely to get plans faster. That's what we will show, okay? In general, I'll show that LLMs can be used in this thing that I call LLM modulo framework. Any of you know SAT modulo frameworks? Satisfiability modulo frameworks? So think of SAT, you know, I'm using the term LLM modulo like as if it is SAT modulo, except of course the usage is somewhat different. So LLM plus other things, uh, solvers and critiques. In fact, I'll make a big point that I want LLM modulo to be mostly about critiques rather than solvers, because you put in solvers, you wind up getting their expressiveness problems, okay? So in the LLM modulo framework, LLMs can help you guess plans. They can guess domain models. One of the very interesting things about LLMs is they can guess anything. They can guess plans, they can class domain models, they can guess completion of a partially provided specification. They can also um, translate formats from one format to other. Uh, my joke is the way I know that I'm talking to an LLM rather than a human is after it says something, then I say, can you please put it in iambic pentameter? And if it right away answers, it's an LLM, unless Shakespeare woke up from death, okay? It's because it's extremely hard for us to do format change. LLMs are very good at it, okay? So these are all the things they can do, and we can actually use them uh, to our advantage as long as you have sound critiques um, and, and style critiques, et cetera, in the loop. So this, by the way, is the broad lessons of the tutorial, okay? So, um, so then I sent you guys uh, this perspective paper which talks about LLM modulo. I'll show it to you in the, uh, in, in the talk too, but I mean, there's a paper on that. Um, Furthermore, you know, it's not just uh, some a AAAI randomly allowed me to give this tutorial with no actual backup. There are papers that we have written, you know, showing that all the criticisms that we are leveling, most of them are actually well documented. So there are, for example, in uh, the most recent NeurIPS, there were three papers, including this main paper, which is a spotlight paper that from which I'll get a lot of lessons. Plus, um, this one tells you how to use LLMs to actually guess the domain models themselves in suggest plans. And then finally, there's a benchmark that we got, gave, one of the many benchmarks that are currently there, is a benchmark that we gave based on simple um, um, you know, PDL planning problems that you can use to see if you have improved LM performance. So that's basically to tell you that, you know, I'm not making this up, there is actual uh, backup on it. That said, when I was giving this tutorial, my biggest worry <laughs> is that this will happen, okay? So these days, if you say LLMs are zero shot XXX, you have to close the doors because people are trying to break in, to come in, to listen to, please tell us how they are zero shot planners, they short verifier, zero shot everything, okay? Um, if on the other hand, <laughs> as I told you, the lesson of my tutorial, you know, they can't plan, but they can be useful in planning, which is a measured nuanced thing. And, you know, I was hoping that maybe two people, you know, maybe Mausam and Boy will show up and the rest of you will be at home, but thank you for showing up. So this was my big worry. Part of the reason, and I kind of do this enough that I know that part of the reason is saying anything negative about LLMs is like kicking a puppy. And how does it, you know, I asked Dali, you know, give me a mean guy kicking a puppy. And it said, no, no, no violence. So I said, mean guy, mean guy staring at a puppy. Okay. Um, so this is basically what happens if you're trying to be critical of LLMs. But then it's just, LLMs have no feelings. People pushing LLMs have feelings and they take offense if you are somewhat critical. Okay. So given that, I do want to point out that I come to leverage LLMs, not to lament them. You know, almost like this, uh, you know, um, the, the, uh, Mark Anthony's speech at the Caesar's death, I'm trying to actually tell you how to use LLMs with clear-eyed understanding of what they can do and cannot do. My, my view is a clear-eyed understanding of the strengths and limitations of technology is a steps, step towards advancing it, whereas a blind cheerleading or unalloyed cynicism are just steps towards you advancing your influencer career. And I'm too old to have a nice influencer career in front of me, so this is what I'm doing. Okay, uh, in particular, one of the things that will keep coming up is 
a lot of studies on LLMs are essentially observational studies. We have become biologists. We have become ersatz natural scientists with no actual training on how to do empirical studies. Okay, so when you find that people are making claims, it's not that they're out there deliberately trying to cheat. It is that they don't know any better. Okay, and, and so that's why it's kind of important. I mean, this is on a communication survey, so you should look it up, um, but that's the important thing. Okay, so just understand that I am not against any technology. I'm interested in using the technology the right way. That's it. I don't want to use it for, you know, when it's not supposed to be working. And at the same time, I don't want to yell at it because, you know, um, it, I'm saying that it will never be useful. Um, so, again, you know, one of the things you'll see a whole bunch of tweets once in a while. Uh, but, you know, that, like I, as I'll say in a minute, that this is also a tutorial because I tweeted everything before I actually put it in the tutorial. But in general, I tend to think that you can use LLMs as great supportive technology. Uh, for humans are uh, verifiers in the loop. And, and I think, you know, a large number of people do agree with this. You know, some of the people that you may have heard of uh, who you might have thought that they might be just completely for LLMs might understand that, yeah, that's not necessarily, they're, they're good for doing some things and not necessarily good for other things. Okay, so this is the foreshadowed summary that should be pretty obvious by now, that thanks to approx their approximate omniscience, by that I mean they've been essentially trained on the web scale uh, collective co conscious that we upload it onto the web, and they have basically been trained in everything there. Um, and so that the LLMs present an amazing resource. They can provide approximate knowledge about almost any task area question. They are ushering in a new resurgence, actually, of approximate knowledge-based systems. I mean, AAAI, I can expect to see people who might have heard the word knowledge-based systems, and they were supposedly given up for dead. And if you're asking yourself what's happening in the LLMs right now, use of LLMs, they're all approximate knowledge-based systems work. The funny part is the people doing it have never done intro to AI because they've gone directly from the deep learning into this, and so sometimes they misunderstand the connections between reasoning and learning, and that winds up being very relevant, okay? Um, there's a temptation to confuse LLM's approximate retrieval capabilities for planning and reasoning, and it's not an easy temptation to avoid, as I will point out to you, and not only my own work, I'll give you other people's you know, amazing examples. We should try to avoid confusing that, um, you know, and I will actually give you um, a case study with planning. LLMs can be used in LLM modular frameworks, both as a source of planning knowledge models, uh, planning knowledge, as well as plan domain models, as well as candidate plans, as well as expanding the specification, et cetera, et cetera, that I'll show you in a minute. Okay, but we do have to be aware of clever hands effect if you're having human in the loop trying to do this iterative route. Yes, sir. That's what I'm saying. So what, what we'll see in a minute is that part will have human in the loop trying to, so the usual knowledge acquisition thing would have been a, an expert just sitting and writing the whole thing. Right now, you know, and for just as for you, you don't know how to write the essay from scratch, um, but if an LLM gives an essay, you might say, okay, change these following sentences and then submit it as my, you know, um, essay, right? You, if you are an expert in knowledge acquisition, Something which actually helps you in writing parts of the domain model can improve your speed up, you know, time spent you spend in making the thing. So that's actually a new RIPS paper. I'll talk about that. Okay. Um, so that's the foreshadowed summary. This is what you would be getting if you survive this tutorial. Okay, a few caveats in case it's not obvious to you by now. This is not a dry chronological survey with a laundry list of papers and their blurbs. I am physically and constitutionally incapable of doing such a boring thing. Um, so this is going to be an opinionated perspective on the state of LLMs and planning intersection, informed, as I said, by my own work in the area. Um, I will actually be expressing opinions of people whose papers I'll be talking about. No personal offense is meant, and they may very well bristle at my particular characterization. You are the judge, and they get to give their tutorial day after tomorrow, and hopefully, and then they get to say, no, this is not the right thing. So that's how I think science is supposed to progress. You know, it's not, there's no point in just giving, you know, dry list of this is a paper one, this is a paper two, this is a paper three. In fact, by the way, for those of you who are graduate students here, 
related work is supposed to show your scholarliness. So please just don't write X did this, Y did this, Z did this. Say why is that connected to something that you're claiming or not claiming. It's very important. You need to be opinionated. You need to go out on a limb and be opinionated. Okay, and of course you have to support it. Uh, otherwise people will ignore you anyway. Um, so the aim is not to make up your mind, as I say, but to equip you with a perspective that you may find useful when you read the literature yourself or work in the area yourself. Okay, and then as I said, you know, multiple times I'll be showing tweets there, but I'm not going to read them. It's mostly to tell you that tutorial has largely been tweeted, so it's sort of a tutorial. Uh, so if you like this sort of stuff, you know, follow me on Twitter. Uh, you get, uh, you know, once in a while pictures of dosas, but also mostly pictures of uh, the, the stuff on, you know, LLMs and reasoning, etc. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Hey, um, actually, it's a <clears throat> procedural question. So um, can you repeat the questions? that they're asked of you before you answer them? We'll do that, yeah, okay. Wonderful, I understand thank you so much. That. Okay, sure, it'll I'll keep, do that. It'll help me keep awake. Okay, sure. I'm making sure the guys here are not going to fall asleep, but I know you are still responsible for your own sleep. Okay. Well, yeah, uh, with, with a few hours away, that's all. Yeah, okay, so that's the beginning part of sort of you know giving a thing, and then um, this the rest of the tutorial is split into three parts. Part one, part two, part three, you know, amazingly named. Part one will give you a perspective on LLMs. I'm not trying to give you an LLM tutorial, but I want to give you a way of thinking about them because this is going to be quite relevant to the many characterizations that we make. It's going to be short. And then a high level understanding of how, when LLMs cannot be useful and why LLMs cannot be useful in planning and reasoning and when they can be useful in planning and reasoning. And then I'll also kind of show you LLM modular framework. That's part one. Part two is mostly all the negative results saying evaluating LLM planning capabilities in autonomous mode, including the effects of prompting strategies, including the dreaded chain of thought, um, fine tuning, self verification. And then also most importantly, understanding the contradictory claims in the literature. It's one thing showing that people were wrong. Other thing, understanding why did they make that mistake? Because it's important. Right? Because I'm not trying to kind of give them a benefit of doubt. I'm trying to make sure that I don't make the same kind of a mistake. So I will actually tell you why the kind of claims that were made in the literature about self-verification, about planning, can be understood based on some misunderstandings about what those problems are. Okay. That's the part two. And then the part three would be the same roles of LLMs in planning with LLM modular frameworks. Uh, we talk about LLMs as heuristics, LLMs as candidate generators, LLMs uh, getting back prompts from external verifiers, LLMs as source of domain models, as we talked about earlier, but we'll go into details. And then LLMs as format changers and specification elaborators. Those are all the nice things. And then, you know, we'll summarize, okay? So that's basically the overview. Again, this is the tutorial slides for those of you who came late. If you want, you can get the tutorial slides uh, from there. Um, so in the... Um, basically, now I'm going to start uh, doing the first part, which is the perspective on LLMs part. Okay. Um, so, obviously, LLMs are n gram models. By now, I hope you understand this that you know you are trying to give in n uh, words, so you're trying to predict the n plus one word. Okay. Are given n minus one words. You are tokens, you predict the n token. You know, the words can be tokens. Okay. And in essence, during the training itself, they have computed this huge probability table, conditional probability table, which is what's the probability of the n plus one word given any particular combination, any particular permutation of previous n words. That's what they're doing, right? Um, the power of n-gram model, just in, as many of you know, n-gram models have been tried from Claude Shannon's time frame, the guy, the great information theorist. But you know, those of you who heard of n-gram models before um, you know, LLMs came along, mostly you heard of two grams, trigrams, uh, four grams, et cetera. In contrast to that, you know, the lowly chat GPT, the original chat GPT is a 3000 word gram model. Okay, 3000 words, given 3000 words, what is the next likely word? And actually I will talk about a little bit about chat GPT, but you know, already we know that the current ones have much, much bigger context. And so all the problems I'm talking about would actually worsen in, in their case too. Okay, so you know, in the case of chat GPT, it trained on about 600 gigabytes of data, GPT-4 trained on a lot you know, more data, but at some point of time, the real data in the web is over. 
So then you will all be hit to produce more data. Okay, otherwise, where is the new data coming? Currently, part of it is we are doing synthetic data generation, and we will be using synthetic data and you know and, and talk about how that is connected to. Okay, um, so in general, you can think of an, an you know uh, chat GPT as essentially computing this conditional probability table. Given the you know words, what's the probability of the next word? Okay, um, so you know I don't, this basically I assume this is AAA. I assume that you know that it basically gets trained on all possible text sequences, uh, masking um, the n plus one word, trying to predict it, and checking the error, and and then back propagating through this huge uh, transformer architecture. Okay, um, with the n-gram model, you need to keep track of the conditional distributions of all the n minus one size prefixes. With a vocabulary size approximately of 50,000, there are V power n minus one different prefixes, which essentially means that even for the lowly chat GPT, you have 50,000 power 3,000 word prefixes. Okay. So those of you who think 176 billion is, oh my God, how many parameters? That's piddly compared to 50,000 power 3,000. If you ask Google, what is 50,000 power 3,000? It says infinity. Okay, I tried it. Okay, because it's just too big a number. And the interesting thing that's happening is, of course, the conditional tables that would, you'd actually be requiring these many conditional probability tables, it's essentially compressing the heck out of them. And it's, you know, and any kind of compression has a side effect of generalization. When you compress, you generalize. That doesn't necessarily mean it's the right generalization. Okay, so those of you who know machine learning, you know that learning and compression are very closely related, and you're hoping that you're compressing in such a way that the test you know, generalization probabilities on the test data will be improved. But you know, we will see that that's the case. Okay. So LLMs essentially are compressing, approximating this ginormous count table. So you should really be so happy that it's only 176 billion instead of 50,000 power 3,000. Okay. Uh, that's where we are. So one other thing is to keep in mind that people generally just assume that mental picture of transformer, it's like a, some big network with a bunch of um, you know, connections. That's how that looks like. But the reality is that it defies your imagination. So somebody nicely made, James Campbell nicely made this um, uh, thing on Twitter that if you think of GPT-4, if you put all the knowledge training data it has, text data it has in books, and then it will have a six fat 50 kilometers. I guess he's some sort of a Canadian or something. Why is it not in miles? But anyway, 650 kilometers long line of library books. And then if you actually train GPT-4 on a good Mac Pro kind of a, you know, um, a laptop, it will only take 7 million years. And then the 1.8 trillion parameters, if you write it in a nice Excel sheet, it will take only 30,000 football, football field sized Excel sheet. The reason I bring this up is it's important to know that these are astronomical sizes. There is a bunch of Rube Goldberg um, you know, AI that's going on too, in the sense that we spend all this time, and then we are trying to see whether the money that you spent in you know, training this is actually going to be amortized in terms of the users that can be done. Okay, um, so ChatGPT, of course, is completing your prompt. You know, all of you have tried. It seems to be, and, and you can argue that all conversation is just completing somebody else's prompt. Oftentimes, don't even let them speak. You speak, and then you can keep completing your own prompts. And the question is, is that going to then solve everything? So, of course, you know all these examples, and you know, um, you know, the, the great, amazing sign of intelligence that the Microsoft people came up with, um, which is apparently if you can write tickle, uh, tick z code for Unicorn, that's true intelligence. I haven't seen a single grad student who is jobless enough to be able to do this fast enough, but you know, it's been considered as a uh, amazing side effect of what uh, these huge trained artifacts seem to be doing. Okay, but the one interesting question is, how can these prompt completion beasts generate such coherent, possible text? The answer, as you know, most of us know, it's currently we don't know, really. Okay, it seems to do very well. I mean, for a guy who's coming from India, who thinks in English is a crazy language, and half the time it's so hard to write a grammatically correct English sentence, I feel like slapping ChatGPT because it doesn't seem to write any ungrammatical sentence unless I ask it to write like, an Indian who doesn't know English, 
and then it will write. Okay, so it's very impressive what it does. Um, some possible factors as to why you know it seems to be happening is we are mostly stuck with observational studies right now. Uh, some possible factors is almost everything we know has already been put on the web at least for explicit knowledge tasks. Um, and then completion over a 3,000 word context window can be way more directed than the kind of intuitions you have about completions for two words, given two words, what's the third word? Do you see what I'm saying? One thing that I forgot to mention there is one of the interesting things about the 3,000 word window, not even you know, uh, 800,000 word uh, uh, window by the time of uh, GPT-4, but uh, the, the 3,000 word window problem already is that the probability that the same exact 3,000 sequence will be repeated once more on the web level data is close to zero. So if you actually try to do it in a brute force way, you will get degenerate conditional probability table because mostly it will have zeros um, for most of the word except for the word that you've seen. And this is what the compression gives you. It is essentially putting non-zeros where zeros used to be and putting something other than ones where ones used to live you know, in the degenerate table. That's a worthwhile thing to just keep in mind for the sanity check. So people also, of course, have looked at not only looking at how nicely they seem to be completing these prompts, they also looked at how they can improve the LLM uh, responses. Uh, many of you know a lot more than I do, but um, prompt engineering has become a thing. Uh, I hope none of you are actually applying to be prompt engineers. That seems like a sad um, job. Uh, when I, when you know, internet started, screen scrapers used to be a job. Okay, and, and then you know, right now, prompt engineers is a job. And so, but the idea is different ways of asking LLM to hope that it'll give the right answer. And we will see that that's actually a very <laughs> questionable uh, thing in multiple planning related things, but you do know some of the prompting techniques. And then of course, the other thing is fine tuning. In the case of prompt engineering, one of the prompt engineering techniques that we will talk a little about is the chain of thought prompting, uh, which has basically everybody assumes that seems to work, except you know, if you press them, they don't quite know what it is that the human is supposed to give such that the chain of thought prompting will make LLM actually solve the problem. And we'll see that in fact, if in fact, LLMs are a student that you're trying to teach, you would expel them because the amount of advice you have to give them at a very low level is just too high. We'll see that, okay. So give this, keep this in the back of your mind. One other thing is the word hallucination has been bandied about. Anytime people you know, want to say that they're kind of you know, trying to make sure that they're not too positive about LLMs, they say, yeah, yeah, sometimes they hallucinate. No, they always hallucinate, okay. LLMs are not databases. It's a good thing. I mean, databases are boring. Most of us didn't take database courses, okay? Databases only give you what you put in. LLMs make up stuff because they're engram models in essence, okay? So in fact, the probability that LLM will exactly reproduce a specific piece of information is just as low, a big piece of text is just as low as you reproducing a large piece of text. We also have, we share that with LLMs. We are also non-veridical memories. That means we are not boring databases, okay? So it's worthwhile realizing that LLMs always kind of hallucinate. And the way I think about it is LLMs always hallucinate. Sometimes their hallucinations align with your reality. At that time, you're so happy, okay? And in general, you can't both say somebody is very creative and also they're truth telling. That kind of clashes, essentially. So it's not surprising. I'm not saying anything that you don't know already. You probably didn't want to think about it right away. Okay, so LLMs are ungram models and thus do, thus do not index and retrieve. All they ever do is hallucinate such that the completion and then such that the completion they come up with is in the same distribution as the text they have been trained on. Essentially, that's what they're trying to find the same text in the same manifold, which is why when it writes an essay with respect to your prompt, it looks like a reasonable essay that some you know, high school student might have written. That doesn't necessarily mean it's actual. And you know enough of these examples. I mean, the liars making the case reports for the judges where you know, ChatGPT makes both, both the case 
as well as the cases also it generates. Like any of you who have small kids, I know you're many of your grad students, maybe you don't yet have kids, but those of us who have small kids know that when the kids were growing up, they get the farm without the content. I have this vivid memory of my little kid holding like a handheld phone, walking around as if he's talking to somebody exactly the way I and my wife would be talking, except it's total gobbledygook and there's nobody on the other side. Right? So they are amazingly good at uh, you, know, Im you know, imitating farm, and that's a very useful thing. Um, that's why we fall in love with it. Prompt engineering doesn't seem to change. People hope that prompt engineering changes hallucinations. That doesn't change it. It's just maybe you might be able to give away the answer. And in, in the cases of things like RAG, I think of RAG as asking Google to give the answer that LLM summarize. Okay. Instead, instead of Google, you actually build a vector database outside for no good reason. But anyway, so that's a thing to remember. So given this, in terms of people saying that LLMs can answer questions that they don't know the answers to, please remember that, um, you know, I, I say, this is the only tutorial where there's also a striptease in the middle. So I'm going to show you my t-shirt that I actually made. I hope I'm, I'm you know, look, I'm an old professor. I need to make money. So I'm going to sell this t-shirt, right? So, so there is this, there's in the t-shirt. So essentially, the amazing reasoning capabilities of LLMs are dependent on the prompter knowing the answer. This is really the problem. This is actually what we'll show, which is why the verifier needs to be in the loop in LLM modulo. Okay, that's a very important thing to keep in mind. And again, as I said, um, whether or not the prompt makes them hallucinate in a way that aligns with the reality that you love depends on very much on the prompter's ability to check what reality they are looking for. So they should know the answer, okay? Um, so with, this all works fine for things like essays where you're not asking it to change the facts, hopefully, but you want it to change the style. You know, one of the weird things that I keep telling my students is we grew up in the human civilization assuming that style is original, content anybody has, right? Interestingly, in the case of LLMs, style is easy to copy. Content is actually winds up being a problem. Factuality becomes a problem. And this is something that you've been seeing in you know, multiple places. OK, so this is all about what LLM small thing is. So the question is, there are many claims. I mean, I shouldn't have said wild, I guess, if, if I didn't want to show my cards. But there are many claims about their reasoning abilities, right? For example, some of the papers. Um, chain of symbol prompting elicits planning in large language models. Language models are zero shot planners. In general, a meme title generator for AI papers these days is LLMs are zero shot XXX. Put whatever XXX you want, and that seems like a, you know it will have shelf half life period of maybe a week, but you'll get some you know uh, people interested in seeing that paper. Okay, so large language models are of course zero shot reasoners. Um, and I love this quote by Sam Altman, where he said, uh, he defined reasoning, you know, like, why leave important things like reasoning definitions to be to the philosophers and AAAI folks, he should define it. So he said, for some definition of reasoning, ChatGPT can do some kind of reasoning. That's the kind of proofs that I hope Stock and Fox will accept, you know, um, about you know, reasoning. But, you know, keep that in mind. Okay, um, so in general, why are these people making these claims? As I said, I already mentioned earlier that, you know, this is, of course, I mean, system one, system two is this metaphor that uh, Kahneman Tversky came up with. You know, please don't open anybody's brain, you know, especially not yours, to look for system one and system two. They're actually metaphorical. Um, so the idea has been that system one, with, uh, you know, explains reflexive behavior from us, and system two explains deliberative behavior from us. And in general, oftentimes, you know, old AI focused on the system too. They focused on problem solving agents, they focused on uh, theorem provers, they focused on planners, et cetera, et cetera. And they did know that you can memoize the reasoning that the system two does into system one so that you can then do reflexive reasoning. For example, instead of a plan, if you compute a policy, it becomes reflexive use of that. Once you compute the policy for a particular class of problems, you can keep saying what's the correct answer without having to do any online reasoning. In general, it understood that you can com convert system two thing into system one by compilation. 
This much everybody understands. The question is, LLMs, if you think about it in this metaphor, they really start up system ones. Okay, the system ones with, ones with a weird situation, they don't have a system two necessarily. There's nothing, nobody ever said they have a system two. The hope is, look, we spent so much money, maybe they got system two. How do you know? Let's write a paper. Okay, so that's the thing that we are hoping for. But you can compile things into LLM just as the way you compile your system two into system one. LLMs can compile outside knowledge into their system one. That's what is synthetic data. So if you weigh, you want to solve planning problems, you ask like FF to solve a trillion planning problems and then train LLM on that trillion plans and solutions answers. So its guesses will improve. This is a kind of a somebody else's system two being converted, compiled into my system one. This is basically what LLMs wind up doing. This is a reasonable way of understanding them. Um, so the question, that's why fine tuning and the pre-training was on the original web and the fine tuning is task specific data. And this is where the synthetic data business comes from. So if that is the case, why are people claiming that LLMs do reasoning and planning? Okay. I'm assuming that if anybody can write papers, they're smart enough. Okay, I mean, we are not talking about, you know, people don't know what they're doing. I understand in Twitter, nobody knows what the heck is going on. But, you know, new ribs, triple AI, you know, people are actually doing, you know, they, are, they believe what they're saying. I don't know, how many of you are Seinfeld fans here? Have any of you seen Seinfeld? Yeah, so in the Seinfeld, they basically say that one time, George Kastner says, remember, Jerry, it's not a lie if you believe it. <laughs> Right. So, so if you don't know enough, you might very well believe something wrong, and that does not mean that you are deliberately making, you know, mis you know, uh, deliberately misleading anybody. So, the two things that I want you to think about: one is approximate omniscience of LLMs allows them to fake reasoning by retrieval. In general, I want you to understand that a memory reduces the need to reason from first principles. If you solve this problem once and you remember, next time I give the same problem, you'll answer it right away. Okay, um, how many of you know this amazing interview question? Why are manhole covers round? Okay, the first bozo who's been asked this question by the Microsoft interviewer had to actually think. And I see some of you are thinking because you haven't been wasting your life preparing for interviews. Right now, anybody who prepares for any random Microsoft interview has picked up the answer for this. And so all you will know when somebody answers this question is whether or not they've already studied the question back. By the way, standardized exams, one thing that is standardized about them is they also have standardized question banks. And the hope is that people have a life and they're not going to spend their entire life trying to just look at every possible question on GRE, SAT, et cetera. RJE, you know, for you know, people who are into IIT stuff. Um, but LLMs don't have a life. And so they actually, if you get all the data, and if, you know, basically, it is possible to essentially convert more of the reasoning into memory. That's something that you want to remember. The second is, when you have the training corpus being entire web, it's not easy for you to know what is and what is not contained in the in the information that's on the web. To give you an answer, before, give you a sense of it before, I'll come back to this slide, but let me show you this. Um, this is an amazing paper. I mean, I asked you to, guys to read this um, by, um, you know, this is Tom Griffith and his students, embers of autoregression. And they have this lovely example. Um, one of which is GPT-4's claims to fame is that it could do Caesar cipher text decoding. You know what Caesar cipher text is, right? I mean, you take a letter and you add, you know, an offset so that ABC might become DEF or something, you know, that sort of a thing. And then it looks like gobbledygook, and then you can easily decode it. It's the dumbest decoding, but at the time of Caesar, that's the state of the art. The interesting thing that uh, the GPT-4 folks claimed is, look, GPT-4, which was I mean, the Sparks people claimed, is that they said, look, GPT-4 was never trained to do this, and it was decoding. Just like it could write the tick Z code for the unicorn, it could also decode this, uh, you know, um, say the cipher text. Amazing. We didn't train it and yet it picked it up. This is what emergent abilities fiction is made of. Right? It, somehow it emerged based on the major training. Okay, is that true? Well, this guy is a spoil sport, somewhat like me, it looks like. And he had his students check 
Caesar cipher text for every possible, every possible offset. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way. Because Caesar cipher doesn't have to be exactly 13 or 2 or something. Right? Surprisingly, it does very well at 13 and does badly everywhere else. Do any of you oldies know why? How many of you know the rot 13 um, you know, uh, command in you know, Unix? So at one point of time, Unix, the way you would actually decode and, and send text files is rot 13 you encode. There is enough data on the web which rotation by 13. If your little kid has been explained the Caesar cipher text, they can do it for one, two, three, 13, et cetera. In fact, they can do it but better for four than 13 maybe because they don't know how to do addition for 13. And yet, if you take time, you'll realize essentially what looks like reasoning could actually be explained by retrieval, approximate retrieval because it has been trained on a lot more 13 data. Now, of course, you can say, oh, okay, now we are going to fine tune it such that it will also be given data for other things. Then you don't get to say it's emergent. I think nobody who fine-tunes LLM to show some behavior gets to say it is emergent. You just fine-tuned it so that it'll show that, okay? So that's the thing that you want to keep in mind, that it's not obvious at all to you. Um, sorry, why is this going? Why is this not going back? Um, okay, yeah, so, um, so that's one thing. The other thing is, so the other thing to remember is in general, from a logic perspective, we tend to have, I assume this is triple I assume, I'm not talking new rips, so I assume people know logic. Okay, there's nothing to be ashamed of. It's one of the amazing, you know, things about human civilization, right? In the logical perspective, the, the, what you say when logical inference is hard is that you give base facts that's been there, so you can look up whether or not you gave a base fact by just looking up the, you know, looking into the store of the base facts. The tricky part about logic is inference, entailment, given the base facts, what else follows? Those of you who know logic, you know first order logic, entailment is semi-decidable. Right? So if you think that LLM normally seems to be knowing things that won't be in what you would think are base facts, and so it was able to actually give the answer, so maybe it actually did the reasoning, Think again, because web data not only contains, in general, what you would consider base facts, but also what you consider a big part of deductive closure. And in fact, much of synthetic data generation is adding deductive closure data to LLMs. Okay, and so once you do that, you could actually do what would have taken inference as a retriever. And again, you should be aware of this possibility so that you can see why that might be happening, just like those guys had to check that ROT13 thing. And then finally, as I said, fine tuning and training from synthetic data further muddies the waters. Um, I, I have this um, to again put a, into perspective the crazy world we are in right now, where you want to solve blocks world planning in the GoFi, which is the good old fashioned AI, which is supposed to be a put down and the LAMI, which is what I made up, the LLM-based AI, here's the way in the case of GoFi, you would get the domain model, you get the combinatorial search planner, you have the planner solve the problem, that's it. Okay, on the other hand, if you're LAMI, and this is, by the way, there are papers on this, and you read this without any sense of irony, okay? Get the domain model, get a combinatorial search planner, get a trillion blocks worth problems, make the planner solve them all, fine tune GPT-4 with the problems and the solutions, alternatively index the trillion solutions to a vector DB for later retrieval augmented generation, have the fine tuned ragged GPT-4 guess the solution for the given problem, ensure the correctness of the guess with maybe an external validator simulator. If by luck it guesses right enough number of times, write a new Rips and iClear paper. This is LAMI. Again, it's a caricature. But you see some of this is actually being done right now when people say we're going to fine tune it so that it'll improve. One of the important issues is when you fine tune or when you give chain of thought prompt, the question is there's nothing wrong in giving people advice. You show one example, remember the whole capitalist thing, give a man fish, I don't know, I'm not a fish eater, but give a man fish, um, you know, he will survive for a day. Teach him how to fish, he'll survive for God knows until the fish are all over, right? Um, the interesting question is, 
you don't tell them like multiple different, different, different times, you know, how to touch this kind of fish, this kind of fish on the Saturday and Sunday, etc. You can give this knowledge, you know, in a fairly easy fashion. And the man, uh, the human being, has the ability to operationalize this advice for a variety of actual it, uh, scenarios. And I'll show you that COT actually fails in that. It, in fact, doesn't operationalize the advice well at all. Okay, so that's the thing that you want to understand. Um, so that's on this side. The other thing is there's this problem in general between pattern recognition and reasoning. And I'm not here to you know, settle the philosophical issue, but I want you to at least understand the following thought experiment. Again, this is triple I assume people know Boolean satisfiability. Okay, um, imagine I want um, a learner to guess whether or not a random three sat formula, uh, three, three sat formula is satisfiable. That means you can give truth falsity assignments for all the variables such that actually it, the, all the constraints are satisfied. Okay, the question I want to ask yourself is, is it more likely the learning system supposedly at some point of time starts showing for, you know, performance? Is it more likely that it learned the Davis-Putnam procedure? How many of you have heard Davis-Putnam procedure? This is the sad life in AAAI guys, okay? So Davis-Putnam procedure is extremely important. Otherwise, you know, those who don't know history are condemned to, you know, okay? And you get a, the advantage of it is you'll get a NeurIPS paper if you repeat it. Okay, so the question is, are you likely to get, uh, are you likely to get uh, Davis-Putnam procedure? Are you more likely to have figured out, are the, is the learner more likely to have figured out that there seems to be this phase transition at 4.3 uh, number of uh, classes for given the number of variables. And on this side, it's hard to satisfy, on this side, it's easy to satisfy. So it just basically guesses based on that. And if you're only looking for how was the performance in the test data, it can you know, blow everything out of the water. It actually can do extremely well. The thing, that's the reason why you don't write algorithms and say sometimes it gives the right answer. Okay, because that's basically where you wind up doing pattern recognition. And the interesting question is it's very useful to have pattern recognition shortcuts. There's nothing wrong with it, but you need to know the difference between, are you, do you know if push, is, push comes to shove, can you prove? what you've done is correct. Sometimes it might be important. So this is important. LLMs may be approximating reasoning with pattern finding and you're thinking it's reason. And that's the difference I want to make. So people can actually get fooled by, or be misled by these two directions and, and make claims that may actually not be um, showing that LLMs are doing planning and reasoning. Okay, so by the way, this is the three sat transition. Okay, I showed this to you already. I showed this to you already. Um, okay, so. The last thing for the first part is, it seems as if LLMs can't do reasoning. I didn't actually talk that much about planning, but you know, the question is, can they be useful in planning at all? I mean, am I, have I, do I have anything nice to say about LLMs with all my stuff saying it's all good, right? Well, actually lots of nice things to say. Um, LLMs as idea generators or muses is their latest advantage. How many of you know how Einstein came up with equal to MC square? That cartoon explains it. Right, basically he was trying MCQ, MC power five, MC power seven, and that cleaning lady came and she cleaned the table and said, now it's all squared away, it's all squared away, and that's how he got equal to MC squared. Obviously it's a far side joke, but the important thing is how you get the idea is different from how you check the idea. How many mathematicians, when at the end of their life, when you ask them, how did you get this amazing idea? We'll say, oh, I was in the office, I was doing you know, paper after paper, and then I got the idea. No, they're always going to your toilet, or going and run, or something else, and the amazing idea happens. They didn't get the award for getting it in this amazingly funny time. They got the award for actually running with the idea and proving that the idea works. And there is such a thing as us running out of ideas. Many a time when people are passing by, I say, hey, I'm stuck, can you give me an idea? and your friend will give you an idea, their skin doesn't depend, there's no, there's, they don't have any skin in the game, and you take that idea and decide whether or not it's useful for you. And LLMs are actually extremely good at doing, because these are friends that are always available, they have been trained on the entire universe of our external knowledge as put on the web. And they can give you quasi-reasonable non gobbledygook ideas. And then you get to decide whether or not they're useful. 
and that's a pretty amazing advantage um, for them. Um, so that basically because of which they can actually kind of provide knowledge, running the knowledge-based systems that used to be part of AI before. And it's, as I said, it's been gone down. As people say, no, knowledge-based system is a bad word. Well, you know, remember the old days, the knowledge-based systems used to be like this, domain expertise, you have to get a bunch of experts who have to sit down and write the domain uh, model, then I mean, domain model, and then, you know, you can that they basically convert into some logical form, and then you have a reasoner on top of it. This, way you get the knowledge can be speeded up quite significantly because LLM can guess large parts of it and that you can then improve. If you are thinking Copilot is useful, how many of you have used Copilot, the code file? Okay, it's useful. Do you believe that that means that LLMs can do programming? If they can do programming fully, then they can do planning because plans are actually programs. They don't. The one thing about Copilot is you're always in the loop. And what it does is giving an idea that, you know, oftentimes you can very easily check whether it's useful to use or not. Every once in a while, this is why there would be somebody on the Twitter saying, oh my God, I spent four hours trying to, you know, chase this evil bug in this seven line code Copilot gave me. Remember, all of us know, we are all programmers, we all know that when the program doesn't have syntactic errors, that's when the life ends, because that's when the logical errors start. Do you see what I'm saying? And, and so what actually happens with LLMs is it can actually show you at least, for example, where the syntactic errors are, or it can give you pieces of code that may have been written by others. And you know, one of the funny things culturally is unlike general web, GitHub is clean. Nobody writes their, puts their non-working programs on GitHub. There's no 4chan for GitHub. You know why? because your employers look at GitHub to decide whether to give you a job or not. And so people mostly put high quality code there. So if you retrieve from high quality stuff, you imagine one way you could have avoided all sorts of problems with LLM is if we, by decree said, there is only one viewpoint in the world and this is what everything should be sticking to. I'm actually happy that we don't do that because it's very important to have all sorts of views. But also that means that it's going to basically complete any reasonable completion rather than the specific factual viewpoint that you might be looking for. Okay, so in, you know, I used to talk about this idea of Polanyi's revenge that you know, for a while essentially AI sort of looked down on getting any external knowledge from the humans because that's a bad thing. Everything should be somehow gotten from the pixels. You know, deep reinforcement learning is a great case in point. And I would say LLMs essentially have shifted. In fact, the people who are most worried, honestly, is deep reinforcement learning people. About the only thing that's left that you still keep hearing about is RLHF, which we'll talk about later. But deep reinforcement learning, instead of that, you can actually get a pretty high level strategy for any random thing like, you know, any random thing that you and I know, such as Minecraft, and then using a bad model, bad symbolic model, you can significantly improve deep reinforcement learning systems efficiency. One of the things that nobody tells you outside of this room is there is gold to be made in deep reinforcement learning. The, the systems are so inefficient that a half-assed idea will improve the performance. LLMs are amazingly good at giving half-assed ideas. We have a paper in ICML 2022, which actually shows that you can use partially incorrect models to still improve you know, the pre-enforcement learning performance. Okay, um, so, um, so basically in a weird way, LLMs are actually ironically avenging the Polanyi's revenge because you can actually get explicit knowledge for that, you know, from them and then improve that. You know, that's a very different way of looking at this entire world. So this finally gets me to this uh, uh, perspective that I want to talk shared with you, and I'll use this in the talk multiple times, in tutorial multiple times. This, this is a very simple architecture that we made up called LLM Modulo, and it has enough colors, it has enough blocks. I want to get you, walk you through why this is reasonable. Um, you know, look at this, uh, you know, take a mental picture, and I'll walk you through this. Okay, so the first idea for LLM Modulo, and I'll show you systems working based on that, is LLM guesses the plan, and a verifier checks if the plan is correct. If not, it will say, it provides a criticism, which is instead of backtracking, think of back prompting. 
and the criticism might let LLM guess one more thing. Is LLM taking the criticism into account and reasoning about it? No, not necessarily, but it could essentially avoid at least the criticism that you pointed out and come up with a new um, you know, uh, guess. And you know, critique basically can check if that is correct. And if the critique is saying it's fine, then it's a valid solution. If you use it this way, LLMs are sound planners. Right? All you need is a critique that checks the correctness of a plan. For PDDL planning, this VAL system, which takes the model and tells you whether it's correct or not. And in a minute, you'll ask, where did you get that model? I'll tell you that that is the model that you can get from the LLM with the human in the loop. We'll show that in a minute. Okay. So this is the bare bones thing. The second is problem specification. One of the interesting things about planning problems, you know, outside of the AI, you know, whatever the, you know, ICAPS world, for example, our specific formal planning world is problem specifications are often incomplete and underspecified. Okay, you might have a huge disjunctive goal and you're trying to figure out which disjunct are we going to actually achieve. And it turns out uh, LLMs can help in defining the specification. The other thing they can do is critiques might be requiring plans in different different formats. So if you understand planning, if you have a temporal plan, there may be causal links showing whether it is causally correct. There may be resource usage saying whether resources are always available. And these could be different critiques and each of them require a different version of the plan. And this format change can be done by LLM very easy. Okay. And um, so, and, and then also this problem specification, in fact, there are papers written surprisingly, that you will give the format of the problem in natural language, English, and LLM puts it in PDDL format. That's, to me, too uh, low ambition because it's too easy to do. Okay, that's why I'm talking about at least expanding the, you know, dealing with the incompleteness in the specification. But there are actually papers written which say that I will say A is on top of B and then out comes on bracket begin A, uh, comma B, bracket end. Yes, LLMs can do it, but they can do a whole lot more than that. And you should be using them for that. Okay, so that's for the translator reformat. Um, then the other thing is, pre until now I was talking about a single critique, but I already was talking about the fact that you can have a causal critique, you can have a resource critique, you can essentially have a, a bank of critiques. One of the interesting things is these critiques can be you know, changing in different ways. First of all, they can be binary critiques. They're laconic critiques saying, wrong, try again. Or wrong, here is the part that is wrong, try again. Okay, wrong, here are all the parts that are wrong, try again. Okay, finally, wrong, try this way. That's a constructive critique. Do you see what I'm saying? And you can have critiques which are laconic binary to constructive critiques, and all of them can become part of the background. And when you send it back to LLM, is it actually taking the prompt into account? Don't ask me when you have already done this for COT and you never questioned whether LLM is listening to your COT or not. You just assumed it was. All I'm saying is this way, at least there is somebody who knows fact in the loop, okay? One other very interesting thing is criticism of plans is not always just about binary correctness. It can also be about style of the plan. In fact, you know, those of you from planning community know that strips would say that one way of coming from Phoenix to Vancouver that is correct is you know go for half a mile by bicycle, another half a mile by car, then another half a mile by you know um, like hitchhiking and do some random number of things until I reach. Um, Vancouver. But you know that most people don't use those plans. They tend to take either bus plan, I mean, not even buses are not even available these days, or the flight plan, etc. Mostly flight plan these days. Right? And so the difference would be are you taking American or you know, WestJet or you know, Air Canada, or whatever. Okay. So the interesting part is it's no longer correct. It's also a question of preferences, it's about style of the plan. Interestingly, style critiques. LLMs are actually can be good at it. We will point out that LLMs cannot be good at checking whether a plan is correct, because if they can be good at that, they can actually do reason. Style, on the other hand, is a lot about pattern recognition. You see a dance and say, yeah, the dance looks good. And you know, if you're an expert, you might also provide you know, these moves look good, et cetera. And so in fact, 
for the style critics, you can use LLMs themselves to train the, to, to get the style critics. I'll show you examples of that, okay? And then um, one thing, um, actually I, yeah, one thing that I, I should mention is that I put this meta controller here. The idea is that there's so many different back prompts coming from so many different critiques. Somebody still needs to combine them at the minimum, combine them, put it into a single big paragraph and give it to LLM, okay? From there, you can think of all sorts of interesting things that a meta controller can be doing. For example, how do I go through the criticisms? You know, do I send it directly to the LLM? Do I summarize them? Um, and one of the other very interesting things is how many of you heard of Tree of Thoughts, the paper? Okay, so it turns out that Tree of Thoughts actually tries to push that paper as if it is doing problem solving agent search as if it's in, you know, Russell, completely wrong metaphor. All it tries to do is diversify the candidates that are generated. Think about what is needed for a generate test framework to work. As I said, the tester should be sound and the generator should have enough diversity that it will try various solutions such that one of them will be correct. And if it keeps on generating the same kinds of solutions, it's basically wasting a lot of time and it's not going to be correct. So you diversify, and those of you who know classical search background, you would know things like random restart search, you would know things like search strategies, where instead of doing chronological backtracking, either you do dependency directed backtracking, or you sometimes do undo the first decision rather than the last decision. That would just completely shift the um, you know, thing that you're trying into a different direction. Classical search people hated it because how the heck are you going to try to put that in a queue structure, et cetera? Bart Selman, it didn't stop Bart Selman because he just said, that's fine, we'll just restart it. Okay, if you're doing local search, which is basically what generate test is, every new thing is being just generated and then I'm checking. There's no problem with it. And in fact, you can explain everything that Tree of Thoughts is doing as essentially prompt diversification strategy, where the diversification is provided by the human. Okay, and it basically explains everything that they're doing without having to talk about actual problem solving, child generation, verification, nothing. Okay, and then finally, since LLMs are approximate knowledge sources, they can also be helpful in acquiring domain models um, with the humans in the loop. And as I said, essentially, these models might be actually powering the critiques. Okay, and you can get that model itself. As I said, I'll talk about the paper and but the other people have been doing this too. So essentially this using LLM to use the models themselves instead of guessing the plans, you are guessing the models. In general, there's a whole spectrum. You can guess final lower level plans. You can get hierarchical planning strategies. You can guess models. And those of you from planning, you have heard of HTN planning. Who was writing the HTN planning domain models? It was hard enough to write strips planning domain models. Who is writing HTN planning domain models? Only Pascal Barker seems to have enough time. This is an inside joke. Only seven people would understand, and they may not be in this room. But the point is that the point is that it turns out that that kind of HTNs can also be guessed by LLMs because all of this has been uploaded onto the web. And in fact, there are papers, as you will see in a minute. There are papers which will wind up seeing LLMs are doing planning because they guessed a possibly faulty hierarchical task reduction. That is knowledge, approximate knowledge rather than reason. And it's very important to know the difference. Okay, um, so that's that. And then finally, uh, finally, if you are into, you know, into uh, synthetic data, instead of depending on poor, uh, you know, half men for FF, to solve a trillion planning problems and then fine tune the LLM. This one will only give you plans that are actually relevant, almost as good as the plans that people may have put in the original data. And so you can actually you know, keep remembering this stuff and then use this to actually fine tune LLM. This way you are using your own system too to train yourself to the extent LLM is part of this family. Okay. And in fact, this has been given a name called self-instructability, blah, 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 in, in LLM literature. But essentially, that's what you would do if you know for sure that what is coming out is correct. If you don't know what is coming out is correct, there's no guarantee that just adding everything that comes to your mind as to the memory is, is necessarily not going to improve, of course. Okay? 
So um, there can be over optimism. LLMs can reason plan with just the right prompt, and they can also you know verify, critique, etc. There's possibly over pessimism. LLMs can't do anything. They can only be translators at best. And really, the quote unquote, this is the other thing that kind of bothers me since I'm making enemies everywhere. The whole neuro symbolic, that's another cult. Okay. Neuro symbolic is putting LLMs and anything from good old fashioned AI into a big box and just say, fight it out. Okay. I think pipelines are not neuro symbolic architecture. If you're just pipelining what LLM says to, your planner, that's not really much of a integration. Whereas LLM modular, actually, there's a lot more connection going on between the verifiers giving back prompts and the verifiers themselves are actually being brought out of LLMs. I don't even need the neurosymbolic badge, but if you want it, earn it. As again, it's just saying, I have one neuro and one symbolic, so it must be neurosymbolic. Okay, that's not a particularly good way to do it. Okay, so the position of this essentially and the, at the end of the first part is LLMs can't reason and plan, but they're approximate knowledge sources and they can play much more meaningful roles in LLM modulo settings. This is the first part, okay? Um, now, before going forward, I want to just press one more thing. Since I'm being, you know, criticizing other people, I should criticize myself too. Am I just finding a way of putting LLM in my papers? Because that's the way to get papers these days. Am I shoehorning LLMs into planning and call it LLM Modulo? It's just that my brand name. Okay, you should be aware of this. You should ask yourself, why am I using this, right? So formal planning systems actually do provide soundness and completeness guarantees. So what am I getting out of this? As I argued already, formal planning systems are too stringent in saying you have to deal with whether or not your problem can be written in our model of expressiveness. If not, it's your problem, not mine. Do you see what I'm saying? In fact, there's a beautiful paper. How many of you here, Sheila, have you seen this? The uh, two thesis of knowledge representation uh, by John Dial and Ramesh Patel. It's an old paper. And basically, at one point of time, knowledge representation community used to be saying, let's talk about tractability, tractable classes of knowledge representation. And then if Han clauses are tractable, if what you want to say is not Han, slap yourself, put it in Han. That's your problem, not ours. And what these guys were saying is, don't ever make users slap themselves, okay? Users have problems, you want to help them solve as much as possible. Instead of saying, I will not speak up unless I have full on guarantees, I'll say, I'll take everything and give you guarantees to the extent possible. And that's basically the kind of thing that LLM Modulo provides. It will allow you to suggest, deal with any kind of a planning problem, not just the ones that you may have been able to write in PDDL uh, 2.3.7, any kind of a planning problem that people will call it planning, as long as you have a reasonable number of um, um, the critiques, you have given higher guarantee that the plan is at least devoid of obvious problems. This, by the way, is how real world planning works, right? I mean, NASA does mission planning. By the way, LLM module is sort of very much similar to kind of what NASA folks call human blackboard, where essentially they'll put this plan and a whole number of experts will look at them and say, okay, we are happy and we are signing up. Or no, 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 there's a problem with this. And then basically this is sort of slowly humans will actually work on making the plan. Except now you have LLMs and you know automated critics instead of humans in the loop. Okay, and so that is a way of essentially keeping that as the best of both worlds. You can provide soundness where it's available and don't ever say, get your, you know, your problem is not in you know, expressible in my language, so I won't use it. So that's the reason why I think it's still useful to look at LLM Modulo. And of course, would I have done this if Altman already didn't take Satya Nadella's money and trained GPT-4? Are you kidding? Of course I wouldn't have done it. It's too costly. But it's been done already. And I only have to pay, I guess, $1,000 or something per month these days. That's what, you know, we all basically pay money to Altman. By the way, that's my other joke that I wish there are doctors in this world who will pay me to find out what's wrong with me. All researchers do this for GPT-4. That's what you guys are doing mostly, right? So it's like a great gig if you can get into it, okay? So anyway, so that's the reason I think LLM Modulo is you know, useful. And the last thing on this part is planning in the age of LLMs, as I said, 
things like deep RL, uh, including even PDL planning, have tried to sort of fall down the hierarchy and give lower and lower level knowledge, pixel level knowledge, for example. And suddenly, you know, with LLMs, you can actually provide something like explicit knowledge. Anytime you said anything about quote unquote explicit English level knowledge, they'll say, who is giving it to you? The interesting part is if you ask a single person how to do your problem, that's good old fashioned AI, bad stuff. If you ask the entire humanity to write everything they know onto the web, and you use such another less money to train GPT-4, and then ask GPT-4, what do you think is the model? That's completely fine. That's called new AI. And it's a reasonable thing. You can do it because it's actually available. Okay. So that's basically um, in the case of LLM, planning in the case of LLMs. Now that LLMs already exist, you have to ask yourself the following million dollar question, which is if you have a doddering know it all uncle ready to hold forth on any question, you ask any question, they'll have a ready answer but no guarantees that the question, the answer is right. Maybe right, but not right, no guarantees. If I give you that, if I give you a, a friend who, who is like a perpetual fount of ideas, would you like to have such a friend? Yes, we do. We like, I mean, once in a while we get annoyed with them, but you know, we do want you know, people who can generate ideas. And my idea is use LLM as this kind of view. And that's basically what LLM module is doing. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's part one. And I have part two and part three. I have uh, an option. I can actually stop here and do part two. Will, as I said, will actually tell you how LLM planning capabilities that have been claimed actually don't hold up. In, in, I can show it to you in simple planning problems. They don't basically do well in prompting strategy. They don't do well not on our sports, even with prompting, even with fine tuning, even with self-verification. And then I'll tell you, you know, examples of this LLM module. I can stop now. And so 3.15 to 3.45 can be the break. Or I can go another 15, 20 minutes and go through the middle of part one. And then do. apparently I have the option. So is anybody wants to, any, any, you know what? Yeah, that's what they said. There is no such thing apparently as coffee break. I asked. 3.15. So, you are Canadians, you have perpetual coffee break, especially you are in Vancouver. Coffee is flowing all the time. Otherwise, how will you live? Okay, but I am fine with, the only problem is if I stop at 3.45, then 3.45 to 6 will be a much longer session. So how about this? I do 15 minutes and then we stop and then, you know, you'll have, obviously. okay. So that at least you know. So can LLMs plan? Okay, so one and a half, two years back when everybody is talking about this, I tried to, have chat GPT and then started asking it to solve some simple block solve problem. This is what's called assessment anomaly problem. If this is me asking it various questions, this is GPT 3.5 and it will give it a prop plan and they'll say, no, the plan is not right. Did you then they say, and then say, oh, sorry, here's another plan. Then I say, the plan is not right. It'll use another plan. And so it's going on and on, you know. After a while I realized, hey, what the heck? I mean, I have better life, better things to do in my life than teaching LLM how to do three stack planning problem. I was very happy. I'm a good father. I taught my son how to do block stacking. It's very important life skill. Okay. But why LLMs? It's not very cute. Okay. So in fact, I basically decided this is, you know, I, I forget in 2022 or something that forget Super Bowl. It's more fun to watch all powerful chat GPT uh, trying to plan a three block configuration. TLDR, LLMs are multi shot apologetic planners that would rather use you as their world model come debugger. You are the the joke is on you. You have become the verifier for LLM. And the interesting thing is everywhere else people take credit, but for the LLM, they give the credit back to LLM because new rips won't take your paper if you solved block stacking problem. They will take your paper if LLM solved. Okay, so the interesting thing is this is what is happening. So we actually checked. This was back in 2022 uh, summer. Um, we checked on with, you know, basically IPC benchmark domains, you know, the blocks world, the logistics world, the various other things, the strips planning, which is people laugh at it saying this is such silly planning, simple planning. Well, simple, but it's very, GPT 3.5 is extremely bad. So we actually wrote this paper saying language models still can't plan. I didn't even know why I have to say it. It's pretty obvious it's a system one. Why should I have to say that it can't? I cannot, I don't have to write a paper saying LLMs can't fly. 
but apparently I still have to write a paper saying LMs can't reason and plan because you guys came up to hear it, okay? Um, so the question, of course, is that's what was done. Will GPT-4's AGI sparks help? After a while, GPT-4 came, you know, Sebastian Bubeck said it has sparks, very good sparks. So we wanted to check if the sparks are helping. So this time we did one more paper. This is actually stuff from the New Rips paper this year. Um, essentially, we set up a very systematic, you know, holding our nose, very systematic study to check whether LLMs do planning. It's almost like saying, can dogs read French? I say, no. Then you say, do, did you do a systematic search to see whether your dogs learned French? I set it up. Okay, so we did basically, you know, um, get the PDL problem, look at different ways of prompting strategies, different ways, uh, and also make sure that you call enough number of problems so that you, it's not anecdotal. By the way, one very big thing about LLMs is don't make anecdotal claims. It can be right sometime by just fluke. You have to actually call like 500, 600 problems to see how it's doing. That's very important. Okay, so we did that, and it turns out GPT-4 upfront actually improved performance. It went from what was like a 0.6 or whatever percent to 30 percent. Hey, GPT 3.5 is 0.6 percent. GPT 4 is 35 percent, and you would say, "Rao, you're wrong," because GPT 6 would be, you know, um, 100 percent. GPT 7 will be 150 percent in correct planning. You know, how can you be sure it won't be? So the question then that we asked. So and it turns out, by the way, just to give you an idea, people also argued that blocks world. This is probably the first time in the world that people, reviewers have argued, Bloxworld is too hard, people can't do it. I've always been told, Rao, why are you wasting your time with the Bloxworld? You know, apparently Bloxworld is too hard, people can't do it. So we actually asked people, people in the Turkers, to see whether they can solve Bloxworld problem. They're being paid low, low money. And you know, by the way, Turkers always, so, so basically they got, interestingly enough, they got 78%, even for that low money. And you guys know, by the way, that by now, Turkers no longer solve your problem for low money. They call LLM to solve the problem. So you know for sure that they solved it because LLM can't have gotten 78%. Right? So people actually were able to solve it, you know, even with their impatience, et cetera. So it's not, I know that this crowd doesn't think you know, Blocks World is uh, like a, you know, rocket science, but other people do. And so we did this too. But the question is, are LLMs retrieving based on names or are they reasoning? I wanted to do something similar to what basically, I mean, this actually happened, those guys work happened later, but we wanted to check what if it just remembers blocks world plans, enough of these blocks world models and plans have been there in the humongous amount of data it's been trained on. So back in 19, so in general, as I said, memory reduces the need to reason from first principles. The question is, is it actually doing retrieval? are reasoning. And in general, as I have pointed out in the beginning part, it's extremely hard when somebody answers a question, whether they read first principle reasoning are actually just remembered from memory. And we are, by the way, smart enough to, if I, if you are coming into this room and they say, Rav is going to ask this question and here's the answer. And then I ask you this question, you won't right away give the answer. You actually look like this, think for a while and then give the answer. So I can't even tell just based on that, whether you actually reasoned or you just gave me enough reasons to believe that you are reasoning. Okay, so checking whether reasoning is happening or not has to be done more indirectly. One way is, you know, in logic, the predicate names don't matter. Object names don't matter. All that matters is the relations between them. This is basically what Shakespeare said, a rose by any other name sounds, you know, smells just as nice. Okay, so what we did, we took the blocks world, we changed the predicate names. Okay, so instead of picking up a block, attack an object, unstacking a block, feast an object, put down a block, succumb the object. This is escape R, guys. I mean, those of you who know, you know, Emacs, just escape R, you know, word to word. Extremely simple. Now, is it going to be confusing to people? Yes, it is, but I'll show you that people will be able to solve this if you give them money. And there is not enough money in the world that you can give to LLM that will make it solve it, unless you do actual fine tuning on this synthetic data. So you do this, sure enough, it went from 34 to 0.1 and 0.2% again. It's not doing reasoning. It's essentially doing retrieval. Okay? So um, this is brand generation mystery, mystery domain. By the way, it's a time to kind of remember a great man who passed away last year or just year before, Drew McDermott. 
who actually came up with this idea of mystery domain because in the ICAPS community, where they were interested in writing domain independent planners, some people were trying to look at the name of the domain and then write a domain specific planner. And to basically invoke a domain specific planner. So to stop these people, he basically made a mystery domain. And we did the same thing, except now instead of people, we try to stop the people believing in LLM, you know, to show that it can't do it. Okay. Um, so then at this point, this came actually at the very height of the Sparks thing. I said, afraid of GPT-4 going rogue and killing you all, worry not, planning has got your back. Uh, you can ask it to solve any simple few step, few step classical planning problem and snuff that AGI for Spark well and good, yes. Just a second. Sure, indeed, yeah. So by the way, so this sort of stuff has been done before in the sense that it's been shown in other places that the retrieval is happening. Um, and I also showed you in the case of ROT13 example. Um, the other thing is we, one of the funny things, interesting, the mind blowing things is remember I said LLMs can guess everything. Okay, so if we gave the mystery domain to LLM and asked, which of the IPC domains does this remind you of? It says Bloxworth. So why the heck can't you use it? Well, because it doesn't know that it has a right hand. It's one thing that right hand doesn't know what left hand is doing. The other thing, not even knowing that you have a left hand, other right hand. Okay. In particular, we actually gave the so making mystery blocks world easier by providing the mapping to the blocks world. So you actually, as part of the prompt, say, this is what I mean by this. This is what I mean by this. Now go help yourself. So I basically, the, the same mapping I gave you, I gave it to the LLM, the consult. Okay. Um, so the last question, of course, is, remember, New Rips people think Blocks World is very hard. Mystery domain is harder than AGI for them. Okay. So the question they want to know is, can humans solve mystery domain? No. Right away, they don't. But you give them money, they will. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? We all try to avoid using our system, our system too. In fact, my joke is entire civilization is about trying to get through life without ever having to use system two. The last set of people who had to use system two really, really is those Colombian kids who got who fell into the forest in the middle of Colombian jungle. There was no Google. They couldn't retrieve a plan. How do we get out of Colombian jungle when you fall out of the plane? they actually had to start from scratch and make a plan. Most of the rest of us essentially follow pretty much good routines. Civilization is about making life simpler so that supposedly we can do other things such as looking at TikTok and you know, um, Twitter. Important stuff has to be done, okay? So human baseline for blocks world, we actually show that in fact, you can get 100% of the people will solve the problems if you give them money. We tried to give LLM money, but it wasn't working, okay? Um, so in general, basically, the point is that we try to slide with the system one as much as possible. But when push comes to shove, we will be using system two because we have one. LLMs by themselves don't. LLM modulo can have. Okay. Um, okay, so I will go into the can alternate prompting strategies help, but I want to take Sheila's question. Yes, go ahead. You have a question, Sheila? Um, so we don't know how humans think, yeah, even I, though, you know, so system one, system two so is system two is not synonymous uh -huh. with logical reasoning necessarily. Uh -huh. And it isn't the case that all inference needs to be symbolic inference. So, and we know that these large language models have a different form of semantics than we do. It's a distributed semantics where words, where the meaning of words and the relationship between words actually is is the semantics of that system and that it does inference using that mm -hmm. type of semantics. So I'm just wondering about the validity of, of, of doing the mystery problem where you've stripped the, the you've created this symbolic okay, reasoning the, path. The same just a second. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. you've, you've, you've created, so what I learned, what I take from that is that that the, the system cannot do combinatorial symbolic reasoning. No, it's where not it doesn't. It, or, it can't do where, mapping. Where it doesn't, 
where it doesn't well but maybe it wasn't tasked to do the mapping it was trying to do I, i'm so, just i'm just wondering about the validity I mean, I of the this experiment is, and okay, just thinking about is, not 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 trying to no completely no this is exactly so when i get into there's a long discussion on chain of thought prompting where we basically again point out that it's all a question it's a spectrum of reasoning it's a question of i don't know how lms work neither do you none of anybody does we can set tests to see whether or not they succeed or fail in various things. So for example, in the chain of thought, you, we can't possibly say that only the things that they do well are the ones we are supposed to check. You sh I should be allowed to test this, right? So similarly, I should be allowed to test chain of thought prompting, which basically, I wish I can get there, where basically we talk about the fact that you can give chain of thought at a domain, at a PDDL level, a domain level, goal level, goal class level, and then finally the very, very, very specific goal. And it's only the last thing COT works, which sort of tells you that they don't have even minimal abilities to unroll the advice you are giving, which is the same thing that was happening here when I told it that this is the mapping. And it still can't do it. That's the point. And it's not surprising. I mean, can you write an AI system it can do? Yes, of course. But that's not what LLM is. So this is another reason why basically I am very, very of the claims that when people say sometime down the line, AI systems can do planning and reasoning, I say, sure, no problem. They were doing it before very slowly and in a small sensing, they will do it later. If they say sometime, next year or something gp the llm architecture the way it is is just being scaled up and it'll do reasoning i would say you have to consider the possibility that the answer is because of the retrieval and i i, I agree with that i just mm -hmm. i just think that 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 first we are in early days and I think I mean, that, that that even i mean if i asked my you know I was if i asked a 2 year old to plan the two-year-old wouldn't be able to plan, but I, we know that two-year-old's going to evolve into something. Yeah, something but I mean, that can, way, you know, unfortunately, so, extremely, with, with but, extreme respect to you, that's a very bad analogy. No, I, yes, I know. Because the two-year-old have a brain which is not a transformer network. Even the biggest transformer aficionados would say the two-year-olds have a transfer network as a brain. Yeah, okay. I'm not, saying that, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I'm just so saying we were in important. early days, yeah. and 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 yes. that and like something. I mean, my point is not about whether AI mm -hmm. will be able to do reasoning. I'm only talking about LLMs, and LLMs haven't changed between GPT 3.5 to GPT 4 to actually BERT onwards. Pretty much, we can actually teach them in the classes. The things that they do change is in things like RAG, things like prompting strategies, things like fine tuning. I do look at all of them. If you come back and I'll tell you, they don't seem to help. Okay, but yeah. So it's uh, 3.30 um, at four o'clock. We will get back and, and we'll continue with the other things. Thank you. The clapping is nice, but come back. <laughs> <laughs>